Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and get started. Looks like we just got a couple more people to come to let in. Um, thanks. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I just want to give a really warm welcome to Jody and Tina, um, who have been so gracious in offering their time today to be, and also uh, being a little bit of the guinea pigs for our very first daughterhood conversation, which is about making a plan and navigating care for your loved one. So in case you are not familiar with daughterhood, we are a community that supports its members around the experience of taking care of others. There are two things that we do. One is that we do host a website that has resources, blogs on it, and a, and a wonderful, wonderful podcast that I can't recommend highly enough and other kinds of resources. This is all on daughterhood.org. But the other thing that we do is we um, support local communities of caregivers who come together through this program that we call Daughterhood Circles. Daughterhood Circles program are, like I said, these local communities, they come together, connect caregivers to each other so they can share information and resources at the local level, which is where so much of the information is that many of you need. So we want to connect you with the people in your community who've been through or are going through what you're going through. So if you're interested in learning more about the circles, including sign up for one or leading one, you can learn more at the circles tab on our website, again, at daughterhood.org. So Jody and Tina are Daughterhood Circle leaders. Uh, Jody lives and leads our Tucson, our circle in Tucson, Arizona, and Tina lives and leads our circle in Owensboro, uh, Kentucky. And just a little bit of background, again, this is our first ever um, Daughterhood conversation. We, our Daughterhood Circle, this is a, an organic idea that came out of a conversation that many of our circle leaders were having together. We realized we've just got a lot of knowledge and expertise in the community of people that lead our Daughterhood Circles all over the United States. And we really want to share as much of that expertise with this with our broader community as we possibly can. Um, so we we've, we've launched the Daughterhood Conversation specifically to do that. And let me just tell you a little bit about the incredible talent that we have on the phone here today. Um, so um, we've got uh, Jody is the owner of her own business, which is called Success by Design. It educates and empowers women to lead their best lives. Her mother suffered a massive stroke when she was 19. So she assumed the role of family caregiver and out of that wrote the book, Life, The Next Phase, which by the way is available on Amazon. And her book is serving as a guide for this discussion and also for many others to come. So I'm gonna hold it up like a good host. Life, The Next Phase, highly, highly recommend. Tina is a client care coordinator at Time Savers Caregiving and Concierge, where she and her colleagues offer and coordinate the services of older adults um, who really want to have a high quality of life at home. And I just want to say here, one of the things I find so interesting about T Tina's work and her colleagues' work is that this company was founded by uh, people who, in having that personal experience and caring for loved ones, realized that it shouldn't be as hard as it is. Uh, and so many times, people who start companies are coming from that perspective. Um, so Tina is on the front lines when families in her community experience the kind of crises that lead to family caregiving. So she's seen a lot. And she and her colleagues are literally the lifeline for these families. So there is so much to do and learn when you assume the role of family caregiver. And one of the most important things that we're going to talk about today is how to handle the overwhelm and navigate the system all while you are experiencing what can only often be called a crisis. It's an, kind of a, you're, you're thrown in. And, um, and so we're going to be talking today about making a plan. And that, that sounds simple, um, but, uh, but it's really hard to do when you're asking a question like, where do I even start? How do I do this when I'm just you know, dealing with the day-to-day -day crises that are happening in my loved one's life. So that's a question people ask the most when we hear from them. Where do I even start? 
So speaking of questions, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat function and we're gonna try to save some time at the end. And if we, if we run out of time and we haven't gone to your question, it's so important to us. And um, I wanna say a couple things about that and just the structure of this, this setup before we get going. <laughs> so first of all, um, please, if, you, if there's something going on in your life at this moment and you really are looking for a very specific answer to a specific question, and we don't, we don't get to that today, um, you can always go to the Daughterhood website and submit your question through the contact and um, you know, a button. Uh, and we, we answer every email that we get uh, from people like you. So um, you can also leave the question in a chat, but just make sure we have a way of getting in touch with you. So that's, that's thing one. We, we don't want to leave anybody hanging. If you came here today to get answers and you don't get the answer you need, follow up with us, please. Um, and secondly, we're doing this in a Zoom format, as you can see. Most of the time, the people who are going to be talking are going to be Tina or Jody or me. So if you want to see our lovely faces instead of all of these other uh, anonymous boxes, just make sure you put it on the speaker view. And hopefully that'll work. And obviously we'll all try to, those of us who are, are speaking but not speaking, we'll mute ourselves and hopefully it'll go smoothly. And maybe finally, we're recording this, as you can see. So if you miss something, you want to go back, it'll be on YouTube and you can access it. All right. I think, I think that's probably all of the, um, the uh, housekeeping. And if there's anything I've missed, uh, uh, Susan will, will put it in the chat function. Um, just to remind you of these things. So I want to not waste any more time on that and move you know, directly to the conversation that we're having with Jody and Tina. And I wanna start Jody with you. Can you please just, it's, just please talk about what happened when you were 19 and how did you, uh, how did your experience with your mom lead you to write, once again, I will hold it up this book, Life the Next Phase. Um, just talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Great to be here. Thank you for the little commercial on the book. <laughs> so my mom, when she was 59 years old, um, she had a massive stroke as a result of a burst brain aneurysm. And initially she was completely paralyzed on the right side. She couldn't speak. She didn't have any cognitive ability. Um, she, I'm an only child. She was divorced, so everything fell to me. Um, and I was, I was completely overwhelmed for several years. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a lot of people to lean on at the time. And I really just had to figure it out one step at a time, which I learned later was not the best way. But we didn't have a plan. I mean, my mom had a will, but she didn't think about anything else. I had to go to court and become her conservator because I couldn't take, you know, pay any bills, make any decisions or anything for her. And that was 1977. So, you know, I couldn't say, you know, Miss Google, what do I do about this? Or, hey, Siri, <laughs> there weren't a lot of resources you know, that we have now. I do want to say that my mom recovered about 80%. She could live alone again, you know, independently up until a few years before her death. But fast forward to 2012, my friend Mary Beth Coza called me in tears because her uncle had Parkinson's and she had just gotten off the phone with her cousin, his daughter, and She's like, I'm, we're so confused. We don't know what to do. I just wish there was a book that told you step-by-step step what to do. And I said, well, I've been through this. Why don't we write the book? I don't know what I was thinking, but anyway, why don't we write the book? So um, we also brought in my stepmother, Helen Hempel, who at the time was an elder law attorney. And together, the three of us came up, you know, came up with this idea and, you know, life, the next phase was conceived. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, what I have noticed so much in the work that we, you know, in our community, 
and the work that I do is that a lot of times when you've been through this experience of caregiving, I've seen a lot of people wanting to create meaning from that experience. Like it, it just, it, the, just the need to, and you know, that's where you see this book, you see the work that uh, Tina is doing and um, you know, that people look at this and go, this has, to, this experience has to have meant something in a broader, in a broader picture for, for myself, my family, my community. And um, so this is so common, Jody. right? Your journey started with a crisis. And Tina, I'm curious if this is what you often see in your work. Can you describe for our listeners what you do on a daily basis and just how much of that is related to somebody being you know, suddenly thrust into a new situation or a crisis situation? Sure. Um, I would say at least... 80 to 90 percent of the time they didn't see anything coming and everyone is blown away by an an event, whether it's a fall or, uh, you know, any kind of incident, hospitalization. So they're they are looking for resources. And if they become connected with us, I always feel like it's important to educate them on what we can and cannot do and then talk to them about their entire village of support. What other resources are they using? So in our case, we're licensed as a personal services agency. So we are allowed to do ADLs, activities of daily living, supporting people in dressing, grooming, bathing, to care, mobility transfers, things like that. Um, And then obviously the, the more I guess, internal support where you're helping them with just engagement and keeping their spirits up and, and, um, and companionship. So that, you know, we have a little bit of a fine line because we are licensed non-medical and we are, for that reason, um, not insurance billable for Medicaid or Medicare, either one. So you have to, they have to understand, you know, some of the limitations on what we can do. And then we want to be able to provide to them what else can help them in their situation beyond what we're able to do. So kind of partner with, we partner a lot with home health, um, in-home medical providers that do home visits, uh, palliative care, uh, hospice, you know, give them every resource that they can use and help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're really, you become like that hub, right? You know, you, you've got some services you can provide, but it's about, it's a lot of what you're doing is connecting these families and educating them. I mean, most people don't know that Medicare does not pay for, you know, ongoing support with activities of daily. You you think, I have a Medicare that'll cover everything, but then you have a crisis. And the main thing you need is help getting your parent bathed every day. And that, as it turns out, is not covered Mm -hmm. by Medicare. Um, So a lot of education, I'm sure that you're doing. Um, And, you know, just kind of going back to the to the plan too, like, so Jody, in your book, um, you really have given a lot of thought, whether, you know, a lot of people are in crisis, but also some people are just watching this like gradual decline happen over time and just kind of worrying about what they should be doing. And you've really laid out this seven step roadmap um, that you can apply to either one of those situations. So, would you, would you mind just kind of giving a little overview? Because what we're going to do is dive into a few of the key pieces of this roadmap and talk about them. Um, and I think it'd be great if you could just give a quick overview and then we can dive into some of them. Absolutely. Um, before I dive into the roadmap, I just want to say that when we were starting the book, Mary Beth and Helen and I spent hours brainstorming all the different situations that could come up. And we had, if not hundreds, close to a hundred. And then we started, like, what would the roadmap for each of those situations be? And pretty quickly, it came up that there were four scenarios and that the roadmap was the same for all scenarios. They might get implemented a little bit differently but the roadmap was the same and we didn't expect that going into it. So it's a seven step roadmap, as you said, Anne. And the first step is to have a conversation with your parent or loved one to really understand what they want for their life so that you can honor that. 
The second step is to do a care assessment. The third is a financial assessment. The fourth is a document assessment. The fifth is helping your parent or loved one maintain well being. And the sixth is to take all that information and put it into a plan. And then the seventh step is to execute and review the plan because a plan sitting on the shelf doesn't do any good. You have to implement it. <laughs> I've heard people say they have a plan, but it's, on, it's in a binder on the shelf somewhere. And then it's important to review that at least annually to see if anything has changed like bank account numbers, doctors, all that kind of thing. And then if something happens, if the scenario changes, then to review it and update it at that point too. Thank you. No, that's, that's, that's really helpful. And, you know, it's, I think on some level, people might be like, well, of course, we're going to make a plan or, you know, but I think it is actually um, one of the hardest things, or, you know, what I would say is like, nobody really ever expects to find themselves in these situations. It, most of the time, as we've already talked about. So, um, so it really is important to kind of take a step back and look at, you know, kind of basically assessing the situation and evaluating where you are and then using that information, you know, to, to make it, to make these decisions. So what you're really doing is supporting some decision-making with a lot more information that you might've had otherwise. And I just want to say one more thing about, you know, cause this is a lot, what Jody just laid out is a lot. We are actually going to have individual daughterhood conversations on, on many of these elements in this roadmap. So we're going to touch on them in this conversation, and then we're going to go into them in more detail in other conversations. And um, speaking of conversations, the first step is having conversations with your loved ones and also other members of your family. Um, in her book, Jody talks about how tempting it can be. And I, we see this all the time, right? You got a lot of stuff to do. You know, you've, you've got a sense of what you want to do here and you kind of take control and we try to impose what we think is best. It's obvious, you know, mom needs to get off the ladder or you know, uh, get some in-home supports and services or whatever it is, or we need to have meals delivered. And this, you look at the situation, you go like, this is what we need. Um, but that can backfire and it can be counterproductive. And, um, and so it's really important in this first step to actually have conversations with people about what they want and what they need and and I'm sorry to have to say this also with siblings on their roles <laughs> so which is hard so Tina I'm just like what are some of the things that you think we should all be talking to our loved ones about whether it's the care receiver or siblings what you know when, based on your experience what do you think is most important. Gosh, um, I work with a lot of large families. There's a lot of big Catholic <laughs> families in my community. So there's there's a there's the one for pretty much every category. There's the medical one and the financial one and the funny one and the one that mom will talk to um, and listen to. And so if if you're with your siblings and your parents are in their 70s or up, I mean, start once you found out their wishes, start talking about who among us has the best skill set for each of the things that are going to come up because it's so diverse that um, that one nurturing daughter that does live in town cannot take it all in. <laughs> she just can't. And so you need to make sure everybody kind of has um, skin in the game. And, and if they can't be that nurturer, then maybe they're the ones that, um, you know, handles finances or sets up POA or, you know, different different roles for different people. And oftentimes you notice it when they're in town or they start to talk about it when they're in town for holidays, um, walking through mom and dad's home. And that's when the, the conversations can come up. Mom, um, you're really wanting to age in place and, and y'all's house is so well set up for it. But there's a lot of throw rugs. <laughs> you know about that? Throw rugs, do, we need, do you need them? Why do you have so many? I don't know, just, and then whoever is the straight shooter can, say, oh, well, let's talk about throw rugs and all those risks and dangers and just don't hide from things, you know? I know that's, nobody thinks aging is a fun to topic, but to me, it's as natural as, as 
giving birth and bringing a new family member into a home. So you plan completely for that. Let's talk about how we're exiting as well yeah. and how we want to see it look. Yeah, I am. So we're going to definitely have a whole daughterhood conversation on this because this is so hard. And I just, I'll share, uh, you know, as somebody who works in this field, you know, I went marching home maybe three or four years ago. And I said to my parents, I was like, what's, what's the plan? Like, what do you guys want? You know, let's, let's talk about your advanced care directives. Like I know better than to let this go undiscussed. And my dad, my dad looked at me, he's born in Mississippi. He was, you know, pre, not a baby boomer. He's the silent, whatever the, you know, great generation, silent generation. He looks at me, he's like, do you think I'm dying? (laughs) I was like, "Mm -hmm. someday you might. (laughs) So it's just, so Jody, like, you know, you recommend things that are hard here, right? First, sometimes we're in disagreement with a loved one um, and we still have to respect their decisions and what they want, even if it puts them a little bit more at risk. And then secondly, we have to talk about scary stuff and we have to force not force, that might be the right word, but, you know, we have to persist. Um, And, you know, curious how, um, you know, what you've seen work in terms of navigating those challenges in these kinds of conversations. Well, I think the key word here is conversations with an S. This is not, you know, we're so um, to do driven, right? It, this is not a on your to do list. Have the conversation, you know, on your way driving home from work, you pick up the phone and say, Hey, I've got 15 minutes. I want to know what your plan is. And we're done. It's a lot of conversations. I find that there is denial on both sides. Often when I talk to daughters, they're like, Oh, my parents are fine. I don't need to think about this. Um, but thinking about it ahead of time is good. And then the parents can be in denial and not want to talk about it. But there's really three goals for the conversations. And the first is for you to get an understanding of what your loved one wants when it comes to where they're going to live, what kind of activities they want to do, how they want to spend the money that they have. So getting that understanding. The second is for them to agree that at some point they may need help. And then the third is for them to agree to make a plan, you know, with you and, you know, your siblings, the family. So those Mm -hmm. are the three goals, but it happens slowly over time. And it can start with just like, hey, you know, Aunt... Aunt Monica just went into assisted living. What do you think about that? And, you know, kind of the back doorway of getting information as opposed to sitting down with your binder. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay, I'm here. I'm ready to take notes. Tell me everything. If you start early, you've got the luxury of time to do that over time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, so I, you know, I want to just... flag for people that were, there's also a conversation happening in the chat function and a number of you have really good, um, you know, good advice and input. And so please be sure and check what's happening over there. And then, um, and then, uh, um, you know, some questions coming in that we'll try to address, but, but Tina, I'm curious, just, I'm going to stay on this topic for one more second, because it's so important, but I'm curious how, like when there are siblings who just won't step up. I mean, we hear this all the time. Like it's, I feel like it's either a sibling that's saying to me, I, nobody will help me. Nobody will step up. They don't get it. They don't understand it. Or it's a sibling who's like, I can't like my sibling, my other sibling won't let me in. Like they won't let me help. They're, they've shut me out or they've kept me out of it. And I'm just curious if you have any suggest let's go to the first more often thing that we hear which is you know my sibling won't help like is there do you have any like suggestions in that situation about how to kind of bridge that divide 
Have you seen anything work in your work? Oh, um, well, not often does a lot of it work because these family ties and dynamics go way back and they're very deeply ingrained and there's a lot of sensitivity involved among the siblings. But I think um, finding a baby step easy job, do you mind to run a meal to mom over a couple of days a week or um, make that grocery click list? and take, you know, take the groceries to her, something tiny that you can assign. A lot of times the people that are perceived to not be involved and not helpful don't have a clue how to be helpful. So right. give them a tiny piece of, of work that's not a big burden. Yeah, right. <laughs> if they could right. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, I think that there's just, you're right. It's just, there's so many ancient, like, family dynamics and whatever is dysfunctional is going to just get amplified in a stressful situation. And just knowing in some ways that that's normal. Um, so we, like I said, we are going to talk about this even more on another call because recognize that this is a whole big piece of it, but because we're doing this, it's kind of an overview. I want to move on to this kind of these steps two, three, and four, which to me, Jody, kind of feel like, you know, the, the care assessment, the financial assessment, um, are, you know, are about taking inventory. So, you know, it's like, what do we kind of, what, what does the, what does our loved one need? What are they, what do they want? You know, how are we going to work together as a family? And then, you know, kind of what is the, what do we have to work with and what is needed from like, how do we just assess everything that we have? Um, and then, you know, kind of those two things go into making a plan. So, um, would you mind just, uh, kind of drilling down a little bit more on care assessment, you know, financial assessment, the, these next few critical steps? Yeah. So let's start with the care assessment. Um, that's looking at today, what can your parent do? or loved one, what can they do? But it's also really important to know not only what can't they do, but what can they do? The things that they can still do, let them do those things. That will keep them engaged with their own life. Um, so it's important to know both of those, but also to look at what kind of help might they need in the future and think about how to get that before it's actually needed. The financial assessment, um, this is especially important for the person who is the agent for the financial power of attorney to understand you know, what assets are available, what um, income is coming in, what expenses are there, what kinds of insurance um, is available, what does it cover? Because we all know that medical and care life care are the most expensive and people are shocked, like you said, Anne, when they find out Medicare doesn't cover it, but they're also shocked at what it costs. I mean, it can go in, full-time care can go into the hundreds of thousands. So, you know, knowing what's there and what's available and how it can be used, but also what your, you know, if your loved one has specific, like I want to leave so much money to you know, somebody to take that into consideration as, you know, pull that out of the equation so that it's available um, when they do pass. And then the document assessment is where are, where is the, you know, Medicare card? Where is the life insurance policy? Where, where are all these bank accounts? What are the bank numbers? Who's the contact? Where's the safe deposit box key? <laughs> <laughs> so what are all the things that they have? Where are they located so they can be easily found? And then what's missing? So maybe they don't have a will or mm. the powers of attorney. And so those things, while they still have the cognitive ability to execute those documents, you know, to get those things done um, so that when you need to access them, I talked to somebody who didn't do this and parents passed away 
And when they were finally cleaning out the house two years later, they found a life insurance policy that they didn't even know existed. So doing that document, doing that. So you have really a clear picture of um, those three areas. No, that's, that's super helpful. And um, uh, I get a little bit of the hives when you talk about the document inventory, because I did that just, I hadn't even done it for myself. Like every time I had to, like, I was like, I don't, if something happened to me, nobody would know where anything was. And I did it for myself. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's really helpful and it gives me a peace of mind, but it was, I was intimidated by that. (laughs) Yeah. I was very intimidated by that. Um, and I, now I need to, you know, it's a matter of also getting that kind of information from my parents. And so, you know, these things take time and you have to be patient and you have to kind of treat it like a process uh, as opposed to something that has to be done overnight. Um, and Tina, I'm interested. So when you, you first meet a family or a client, you know, who's in um, kind of what are some of the things that you're assessing for or looking for? I'm going to guess lots of times you're, you're coming into their home for the first time and yes. uh, kind of looking around and assessing the situation. Where does your brain go when you are in their home for the first time? Um, typically, it starts with the physical surroundings. Um, how conducive is this home for them to stay here and age in place long term? How how well set up? Is it what type of uh, supportive devices, grab bars, shower seats? Uh, And we usually take a little tour and uh, do a walkthrough of their bathroom situation, how they prefer to do it, and then make suggestions on any needed um, or things that I've seen that people, it's very, you got to be very careful not to make too many suggestions and seem bossy, but things that can be really helpful are, you know, a different type of shower chair that you can enter from outside the tub and swing around and, um, you know, hand bars in certain places and things like that. So you do that kind of a physical inventory and find out what rooms they live in, what their living space is. And then you start to talk about their routine and their habits and their preferences so that you're equipping a caregiver to come in and understand. You may really want to do something important with Miss Smith at six, but she's going to watch Wheel of Fortune. So that's her favorite show. If you ever want to engage her and she's got the blues that you've got, this is her favorite song. These are her favorite shows, positive triggers. And then on the other side, any negative triggers, you know, get to know that person. And typically the family chimes in and you ask enough questions, you kind of, people start to reveal what their lifestyle is like and you know, if they're going to be comfortable with a chatty person or mom wants to be left alone, just pop in and check on her, but don't expect to engage. She never was social. She doesn't need that now. Learning all those details. I'm just feeling right now, like your clients are so lucky to have you. I'm just Aww, thinking, I'm just like, can I, I'm going to, I have a, I'm going to send you out of state. You're <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I got, I've got now a whole other, I have a plan for you. Um, I mean, it is, I will just say that um, I, I want to just take a quick pause right here because a lot of the stuff that Tina is talking about, um, you know, we don't actually have a system in this country for providing that kind of like entryway, you know, into this phase of life. Um, people who live in Owensboro, Kentucky are incredibly fortunate to, to have this organization of Tina and her colleagues, but this, again, this isn't something that insurance covers. We have to, it's not something that, that is provided by the government yet. And, um, and so some, every family to some extent is sort of creating all of this for the first time, um, from scratch by themselves, which is why we're having this com- these com- this conversation and other conversations. So just, you know, I just want to, like, I just want to flag that, you know, this is, you know, we have a gap in the larger system here that is a big part of the reason why we have to have this community and we have to have these conversations. But hopefully over time, as more and more people get older and we have more 
you know, fa fewer family caregivers to the number of older people, there's going to have to be, I think, more of a public response. Otherwise, I don't know, you know, like I just think about my own family, you know, I've got, you know, my kids between me and my husband and their dad and his wife, and then my stepdaughter's mom. And it's, you know, there's three kids and there's like six adults who knew, who will need care someday. And I think that's a situation many families find themselves in. Okay. So I'll get off my soapbox and we'll keep going. Um, <laughs> that's what I, so what I do for a living is, is to, to think about these systems things. And I'm always really, really aware of that. Um, so we've made this, we've, we've done these assessments. I'm going to move on to step five because I think it's so interesting that Jody included in her steps as step five, this concept of maintaining well-being. And most of the caregivers, and I think we sort of self-select into care, into daughterhood that most of the people that we have in our community, this is their primary focus is, is maintaining the dignity and well-being of their loved one. I mean, this is like, this is so important to all of you and the people that I hear from. I know not all caregivers are like that, but certainly, certainly you folks are. And, you know, I think it's just so easy to get, you know, very, um, you know, uh, hung up, I guess, on all the errands and the to do's. Um, we can, it's easy to kind of overlook what's going on, like socially and emotionally with our loved one. And, and so Jody, I feel so lucky to have you here to talk about well-being because I think this is something that you it's an area of expertise for you just generally, but what is your definition of well-being and how do you think about how to protect that and your loved one while also protecting your, your own? Yeah, well-being is so important. Like you said, we can get so caught up in all the tactical stuff that we forget about the person. Um, we forget, we start, we wear our caregiving hat so much that we're not the daughter anymore. I always say you have two hats and you have to switch back and forth between them. So well-being really is your mental, physical, and emotional aspects of your life. And it's not an either or, it's a continuum, right? So you can be high well-being, low well-being, or somewhere in between. And the goal is to maintain that well-being um, for whatever the situation is, right? It's going to change as they age. It's not always going to be the same, but it's really um, around our, their thoughts, their feelings, their actions, what happens, how they handle the events around them. And one of the important things around that is social connections. I know introverts don't need to have as much social interaction. Um, I'm one, so I know. <laughs> Been home by myself for a year <laughs> and I'm just fine. So, but it's still, you know, they still have friends, family, important people. And it's so important to maintain those kinds of connections because Social engagement um, has been found to, um, it's related to longevity, resilience in the face of adversity, better overall physical health, and it's been shown to um, reduce the risk of dementia. So that's a big one. Also exercising both the mind and the body, not just the body, but you know, the healthier you can keep your body and the more active you can keep your brain. But that's going to change, you know, over time. Like, you know, if your parent loved doing jigsaw puzzles, but now they've got some dementia and that's too overwhelming, then that's not the way, you know, to maintain that well-being. So like Tina was saying, you know, what are the things that at this stage right now do they enjoy and make sure that they get them. And then just, you know, simple things could be maybe getting, taking them for a mani-pedi so that their feet are massaged and their hands are massaged or, you know, listening to their favorite music. There's a lot of research about Alzheimer's dementia and music and memories. Looking at old photo albums and, you know, reminiscing about things as 
as we age, there's we want to maintain that independence as long as possible, but we also want to leave a legacy. And one of the ways of doing that is looking at photos and explaining to people, you know, what they what was going on in their lives and really making those kinds of connections. I used to do that with my mom. She had photo albums. My mom actually worked in the Pentagon during World War II, and then after World War II, worked in the American Embassy in Denmark. So she had all these photo albums, and it was so interesting to go through them and to learn all those stories. Um, so it was a great activity that I would do with her periodically. It's That's beautiful. That's just, thank you so much. That's, I, I, I love everything that you just said. Um, especially the leaving a legacy, the importance of that. Um, and Tina, you, I, I, I can already, from everything you've already said, I, I know that the well-being of your clients is paramount to you and your colleagues. Is there anything that you talked a little about this? Is there, you're looking for those, those things that matter to them, what's giving them joy, like that television show at whatever time, anything else that, that is, is a, special focus for you all? Well, I think um, we definitely document the activities throughout the day for families and we make note of things that did bring them joy or if their mood or demeanor was a little off today or if they're not moving, getting up and walking like they used to, documenting all those kinds of things. So it's physical, emotional, just like Jody said. But um, I think the main thing is to create a culture where you don't always talk about the physical ailments. How's your knee today? You know, mm -hmm. you know, their knee is giving them trouble. They've had an operation or, you know, whatever the situation is, but just um, always, you know, talk about the uh, surroundings, create a culture where we're talking about, you know, what's blooming this spring. And maybe we should go for a drive and look at the dogwood azalea, dogwoods and the azaleas out um, in full bloom right now. And, just talk about things outside of that physical thing that can appeal to their spirit and you know lift them up because we know it directly affects their physical well-being too. So yeah, yeah. You know, I want to just respond quickly on that and we'll we'll do step six and seven and then we'll we'll take some questions. But I um, you know, I there are two things that I have struggled with around this topic we're talking about right now, maintaining well-being. One is that um, I have definitely noticed that caregivers feel a lot of guilt about not being able to do enough. And I just, I want to just flag, like I can imagine some of them listening to this thinking, oh great, there's one more thing or one other way I'm failing or it's all too much responsibility. And um, that is, I think, really normal. Um, it's a normal tension, you know, um, I think the, um, uh, you know, the, the other thing is that sometimes it is hard to know, you know, something that would seem obvious to me, um, like, you know, I want to give my mom a break. My mom's the primary caregiver. I want to give her a break, you know, so I organize a way for her to get to the spa, but she actually doesn't want to break, you know, she's, you know, like leaving my dad would cause her more anxiety than, than it, we would ever make up for at the spa. And so I just, to me, this is, this kind of corresponds back to that first step around the conversations. It's like this, you know, you're, you're, you're learning and listening and assessing and not feeling guilty. <laughs> right. So Jody, do you want to, I just feel like your thoughts about that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think as women, we think that we have to do it all. We set the bar, I think, impossibly high and we expect to meet it. And when we don't, we beat ourselves up about it. You know, this is something that I talk about all the time is that sometimes we're meaner to ourselves than we would ever be to somebody else. So stop that. <laughs> but I have a favorite quote by Theodore Roosevelt that says, do what you can with what you have, where you are. So your best is gonna be different from day to day. Heck, your best is gonna be different from hour to hour, let's face it. <laughs> so um, I'm big on prioritizing things, looking at what are the most important things that have to happen today. 
you know, one to three things and make sure those get handled. And if there's time, others, but, um, you know, focus on what's most important. Don't get caught up in all of the weeds. And a big one is to ask for what you need and for help. You don't have to do it all alone, nor should you. Um, you know, that's why one reason daughterhood is so great is that, you know, we share resources and can help each other out. But ask, 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 ask when you need help. And if you've ever managed people, you know, you've got your to-do list and then you identify what you can delegate, do the same thing. So people do want to help. And you can call, like Tina was saying, just start with something easy, right? Just if someone says, what can I do to help? We often go, oh, nothing, I'm fine when we're drowning. So look at your list and say, hey, I've got a box that needs to go to the post office. Could you, would you mind taking that for me? Things like that. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, yeah, Tina, anything else you want to add on this topic? Well, when I was listening to you talk about your mother and her guilt of leaving, just kind of appeal to their, their heart and soul by saying, how would dad want you to take care of yourself? Like, what would dad think? Wouldn't he want you to show yourself the same love and grace that you're showing him? He would worry about you. If he really were, if, you know, fully capable, he would not like to see you become, you know, to sink with the ship it is essentially what can happen when people are primary caregivers and they will not relinquish control or show themselves any self-care. Yes, this is, well, exactly, how do you feel? this is exactly the conversation I have with my dad too. You know, I sort of like, you know, fighting my mom for, to let me take over in the kitchen. And then my dad, anyway, it's, these are all just really normal, normal family things, right? You know, mm -hmm. Roles are shifting. People are entering into new roles that, you know, it's very, it's tricky and it's, um, we're going to be doing it more and more and more as the population gets older. So, you know, I've seen a lot of, there's so many good suggestions in the chat. I cannot stress highly enough that you should re scroll through them. One of the things I'm noticing is that you know, one of the challenges that people are noting about the plan is a plan, a good plan is not a plan you make and then you don't look at again for 15 years. Um, it's not even necessarily when you make a good plan, it's not necessarily when you make even before the crisis. It's think of it as sort of, it's less like it's not a static thing, it's a process. And I, I just say that because I think it's, you know, um, you know, we are kind of constantly evaluating our loved one's wishes and wants and needs for well-being, the kind of assistance that they need, the resources that are available, what's in place, um, pulling it all together and making a plan. Um, and so, Jody, one of the things I really love in, in your book is you sort of show very clearly, like, here's kind of what the needs are, here's what the options are for meeting those needs, and then here's kind of where those resources might be available. So it's just that process must, I think, be very helpful to people and just feeling like, okay, you know, we're kind of getting this under control. Um, any, you know, anything you want to sort of share here about what, like, kind of how to approach this once you have all the information? Yeah, so the previous steps were all information gathering, which is good, right? <laughs> but the plan can be everything from strategic to tactical. And, you know, examples of the tactical is, you know, making a list of all the things that mom or dad or loved one can't do and is going to need help with. And then looking at who can be the one that can do it. Or, you know, maybe it's using Instacart for grocery shopping. You know, maybe someone doesn't have to physically go do that but really identifying who's on point, when they're going to do it, almost like a project plan, a <laughs> Gantt chart, if you will, <laughs> not to get too technical, but map all that out. And so there's no question of what's gonna get done, who's doing it, when's it when it's gonna happen. No, got it. Um, and is your, when you, Tina, I'm sure your organization is 
the kind of the care plan is an essential part of how you, you know, know what to do for your clients. And um, what I, I'm curious what kinds of things you all include and how you decide what to include in your, in your, in your plans. Well, it is, um, we want to know the level of assist that they need at each, on each of the activities of daily living. And if you have a long-term care policy, you need to know your ADLs, your activities of of daily living, because that is critical for that process. But that's something we, we try to assess is, will they need no assist, minimal assist, um, semi-assist, full assist, and then have that laid out so that the caregiver knows, you know, they, what, if they use a walker, they are using a cane, um, they may not use a gate belt, but we are strongly encouraging it. The doctor encouraged to try to implement the gate belt. Um, those kind of things, where medications are stored, where, who's the pharmacist, the primary care doctor, the emergency contacts, um, what, you know, hearing aids, locations of all of their supported devices. And, you know, like I said, it is licensed non-medical, so we, we don't get into deep detail on their diagnosis, but more how we're going to support them in the home. Got it. No, that, I mean, this is a, like one of those technical things that, you know, until you've entered into this world, you're like, ADLs, what is that? Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's the foundation of everything. Like how well can your parents or loved one do something by themselves? <laughs> how much are you going to have to be like uh, engaged in helping with those activities? And that is, that is a underpinning of everything, honestly. Um, so I, we are, uh, we're, We've been chatting for uh, a while, and so I want to just say a couple quick things. Um, there's a there's a couple of questions that have come into the chat. I want to make sure we talk about, and so, you know, I just maybe I'll just kind of wrap this part up by saying, look, you, there's a lot more to sort of creating and executing the plan. We talked about some of it, which is, you know, again, just just really thinking about pulling together your team. What is it you have to do? And, you know, I think some of us are better at planning than others. Some people are planners and some people are not planners. And I can relate uh, to both. And and what I would say is if you're not a planner and this all feels just overwhelming and hard, that's where I think, you know, asking for help, finding somebody in your life who, like you do have that really great friend who's really good at this, who over a couple glasses of wine or a couple cups of coffee, be willing to sit down with you and sort of help you um, so that you at least just have like a little bit of a roadmap to work off of. I think that's just want to acknowledge that not everybody's really good playing. Okay. So having said that, I'm Jody and Tina. I do want to just come back to one quick thing before we we really wrap up, which is about cognition and cognitive challenges, because, you know, these, you know, a couple of things like, Sometimes things happen to people's brains quickly. You know, you have a, a, you know, a stroke or something that makes it, you didn't have a plan and now suddenly it's impossible to have those conversations or somebody has dementia is declining cognitively over time. Um, Just any thoughts or advice for people in that situation? Maybe Jody, can we, I'll just, since you have direct experience with the stroke, maybe I'll start with you. It is such a challenging situation because if you don't know what they want, you just, you know, you can spend your life beating yourself up wondering if you made the right decisions. But um, hopefully, I mean, in my case, I was still living at home. So I knew my mom really well. And that helped me a lot because I had a good idea of you know, what she did in her normal day, how things were different, the things that she really liked. Um, And I did have to, you know, step in and make decisions because I couldn't ask for several months. And, you know, I still hope I made the right decisions. It's, I don't know how, it was in 77, 78, I still second guess, you know, did I do that the right, the right way? I think you just have to you know, do the best you can. If you're not sure, get advice from others. Um, My stepmother taught me something. Helen taught me um, at one point when my mom was, um, 
she, she died, almost died a couple of times. And one of them, she asked the doctor, if this was your mother, what would you do? And that was great advice because then they were answering as a person, not as a doctor or, you know, as an attorney or whatever. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's a great question to ask any care provider. And, um, and so, uh, Tina, when you have clients with cognitive impairment, dementia, you know, sort of how, what, any, what kinds of things do you all do to help them? you know, to help sort of assess um, like with their needs, wishes, wants, um, any, any advice around that? Most of our caregivers that work directly with the client, they are going to know how to communicate and, and, and allow for a successful visit. It's the bigger issue, making sure families are educated and understand the, um, the dynamics of it all because the dementia is so tricky if education is so key a lot of times family members that don't really understand will think mom just keeps talking about where's dad where's dad and i have told her a hundred times i'm sorry dad passed away well you know the dementia program that we model or we tried to train and model after is tipa snow's program yeah. um, positive approach to care love her and and have a certified person on staff that trains on that. But, you know, she, he's out in the field. He's, he's, on, he's on this tractor, you know, he won't be until later. And then it might. Oops, Tina froze. Oh no. Well, we're running, we're coming up on time anyway. I actually know what she was gonna say, which is that, it, which is just that, there's a, there's a whole way of being in the moment with people with, with dementia that doesn't require that you give the exact right, accurate answer. And I just put Tipa Snow's name in the chat because that's an incredible resource. Um, and so we're right at time. And um, I just want to thank you all for coming to our first conversation, being our, um, our first audience. We're going to have more. Please, please, please come to our next one on, I believe it's May, oh good, Robert's gonna share his screen in a second, yay. Um, Thursday, May 20th, same time. You are not going to be disappointed. These two ladies are fabulous, phenomenal experts, uh, elder law, financing, paying for care, all that hard stuff. So, so please come and, um, and do not miss our podcast. Uh, with Roseanne Corcoran, on, I think it's on iTunes. You can find it on our website. Uh, she's she's a tremendous resource, and I'm just thrilled uh, that we have that for you all. So, thanks again to everyone. Um, love you all. Visit us, email us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And most of all, please take care of yourselves. Bye. <laughs>